technology ecosystems to find innovative solutions to local development challenges. And that okay. network has been particularly successful in stimulating those digital economies. And there's about 50,000 people that have been trained over the last two years through that tech hub network. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much to Mrs. Scully. As I did mention earlier, we are trying to keep the time tight to make sure that everyone gets a chance. I'm going to come back to Ms. Paula Inarbeer, Minister of Information and Communication for Technology for Rwanda. Good morning, and I hope you can hear me because we are struggling uh, for those of us who are online to, to hear what's happening in the room, but I hope um, you, you can at least hear me clearly. Uh, I'll be very brief, and, and I think uh, Paul has uh, extensively uh, shared um, really the benefits, but also the importance for multi-stakeholder partnerships to happen uh, in order to drive meaningful connectivity. And very specifically, um, just looking at Rwanda's example and, and what we, we continue to do uh, beyond really looking at how do we ensure uh, that we have the right legal and regulatory reforms that are essential to drive uh, meaningful connectivity, but also accessible connectivity for all. Um, then also looking at the universal access policies uh, that also that are not just looking at access, but also ensuring that affordability is achieved uh, as we drive uh, broadband con connectivity for, for all and making sure that no one is left behind. And the third part uh, for governments is also looking at how do we stimulate demand. It's one thing when you have high speed affordable broadband connectivity, but what are the things that you put in place from uh, you know, building digital literacy skills to digitizing services, um, but also making sure that devices are affordable so that um, citizens can also afford uh, to use uh, uh, and benefit from this infrastructure that has been put in place. And when I swing to the private sector side, it's really putting in place the necessary technical and financial investments that will allow uh, for us to have this affordable infrastructure across the different countries. So again, uh, to ensure meaningful, affordable and accessible connectivity is not something that can be achieved by one partner on their own. We all need each other so that we are able to deliver this uh, at scale. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I now invite Mr. Lee, the Under Secretary General for Economic and Social Affairs. I believe he's going to come to the podium to also respond to the question. Let me just, I had prepared a statement, but just let me go to straightforward to those, uh, the key uh, elements I would like to share with the all participants. Uh, to this um, annual session uh, for the IGF um, from UN DESA, uh, we believe uh, several things we can do. Number one, let me see. Uh, we need to acknowledge that the road of this forum, IGF, as a network of networks. Over the years, IGF community has exchanged an expert experience and good practices and explored the policy solutions for connecting the unconnected. So the IGF has more than 150 national, regional, and youth initiatives. More than 45% of these are in the global south, contributing to the capacity building and the knowledge sharing in the internet governance. The IGF collaboration with the schools and on the internet governance also contributes to the institutional and the individual capacity development. The IGF can also accelerate the universal connectivity by creating new partnerships and by generating new ideas. Second, moving beyond our support to the IGF, UN DESA connects the multi-stakeholder discussions to multilateral approaches on science, technology, and innovation. The reach outcomes of the IGF the annual meetings, for example, are brought to the UN high-level political forum supporting the implementation of the SDGs. 
the high level political forum is a critical platform to be leveraged by IGF. Every year since the 2015, the nations have come together in New York to, to evaluate their efforts to achieve the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and SDGs in the high level political forum. In this most recent ministerial declaration, the member states of the UN called for the action on several fronts relevant to the, our discussion today, including promoting digital technologies, connectivity, and access to broadband internet connectivity. Second, to advance the digital inclusion and the literacy and incorporating digital com competences into the education system. Last but not least, enhancing and developing digital skills and the competences. UNDESA also supports the integration of the IGF activities with the work of the technology facilitation mechanism, which has engaged with thousands of scientific and technological stakeholders since its launch and its science and technology and innovation forum. Thirdly, our research on the e-government is a valuable resource. We analyze how public administration uses the internet and digital technology to deliver services to the people. We recently launched the UN e-government survey 2022, the, the future of the digital governance. The 2022 survey found that digital technologies were central to the how the governments address and continue to address the COVID-19 pandemic. The 2022 survey, which is the 12th edition of its publication, also calls on the government to strategize and invest more in long-term national digital transformation. So distinguished participants, advances in technology must ultimately serve the wider growth of supporting sustainable development and leaving no one behind. This is our goal. This is our expectation from this IGF. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lee. I'm now gonna ask Mr. Antonio Pedro to also answer that question and I'm gonna repeat it. How can multi-stakeholder partnerships contribute to universal, affordable and meaningful connectivity? And how do you see the respective roles and responsibilities of actors like governments and the private sector? Hello. It's on. Yes. By all the heads of state and government as a pathway for Africa to claim Agenda 2030 and Agenda 2063. But in doing so, they recognize that digital transformation is key to achieving those goals. And that's important. It sends a very clear signal. So, and we recognize also that achieving that requires the contribution of all the stakeholders that have mentioned earlier by the previous speakers. So we as ECA, therefore, we use our uh, three functions, the convening, the think tanking, and the operational or advisor services for supporting, first, demystifying uh, the conversations about uh, internet and, and its role in society. And that's important. It simplifies uh, the, 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 the conversations. We also um, identify the opportunities 
for uh, all the stakeholders to participate. For example, uh, we are supporting our member states to formulate national African continental free trade aid strategies. As you know, the ASCSTA is deemed as the uh, uh, Africa's Marshall Plan. Um, it will create an, uh, a market of 1.5 billion people uh, with no tariffs and, uh, and other barriers. This will enable the emergence of uh, uh, small and medium enterprises, regional value chains, which require uh, digital uh, uh, as means to uh, enabling trade and so on and so forth. That's important. So understanding what the opportunities are, providing that information uh, freely and available to all the stakeholders so that they can invest. And then of course, supporting with harmonization of legal. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Uh, morning, everyone. Madam Chair, was that part of my two minutes? <laughs> I hope not. Um, okay, good. I'm, I'm, I'll probably take less time than that. So good morning, everyone. My name is Kodjo Bwetcha. I'm Vice President of Public Policy for Africa, Middle East and Turkey. First of all, a huge thanks to those who, like Ryan, who I met this morning, who helped put together this event. And an admission from me, this is my first IGF despite working in this sector for 20 years. So I'm incredibly excited. I think the question of the importance of multi-stakeholder partnerships has partly been answered by certainly a friend and colleague, uh, Honorable uh, Paula uh, and uh, Mr. Scully. Um, and, and by the presence in this room, I think we're all convinced of the importance of multi-stakeholder partnerships, whether that's in setting goals, as we've seen with the Sustainable Development Goal 9C, I know a lot of people will argue it should be more explicit. Um, any of the ITU goals or that we've set as well, I think it would speak to the importance of multi-stakeholder partnerships, as well as the development of policy and regulation that we've seen come out of organizations like the, the ITU. So I think that question is well answered. I think the question about the role of, of stakeholders is, is possibly more nuanced as I thought about it. So I think generally we speak to governments creating the policy and regulatory framework for us to go and use, um, for, for private sector companies to go and use. Civil society organizations being in some ways watchdogs, but also being those who inform regions or parts of, the, of, of where we should go to, as well as the goals as well. And then the private sector should go and invest. And I think it's often more nuanced than that. I, I do think those, those um, uh, roles are important and necessary, and that's what happens, but sometimes more nuanced. So, the private, the, the, the government should certainly set the agenda, should set policy and, and regulatory environments that are conducive to investment, are conducive to increased uh, access and affordability. But at the same time, sometimes governments have to fill the gaps. When we have access gaps, that's where the governments need to step in. That's why we have things like universal service funds. Is that the two minutes? So can. So can I take 15 seconds? Okay, I'll take an extra 10. When, when done well, that's why you get great projects like To Africa, which is Meta's project with seven other partners, the first submarine cable to connect east to west or west to east, hitting or connecting 33 countries across Africa, Middle East, Asia. Um, and you, uh, it will bring more capacity than all the cables at this point in time. And my view is each of us should know those roles and execute those roles excellently to see projects like that. Apologies, Madam Chair. Let's try this one. Thank you. Uh, Director General of ETNO representing Telcos of Europe and also sitting in the newly constituted IGF leadership panel. Uh, we all know connectivity is extremely important and it's vital for all of us. There's no way around this. But connectivity is expensive as we just heard. We need investment and the deployment of 5G and fiber is an extremely capex-intensive uh, activity in the industry. So we need the cooperation of government, public funds, private sector, deployers of connectivity, and it's essential to make sure that the funding 
and the infrastructure rollout is going exactly to those places and communities which need it. So governments can help in making rollout easier and point to the places where it's needed, but industry can also help community-led out uh, infrastructure. I think these are uh, important. But we also need that investors need clarity and certainty that they're making a good investment. So connectivity needs to be meaningful and affordable, as we've talked about. But we cannot risk undue government interference. We cannot risk the uh, network shutdown. We cannot have top-down mandating of standards and protocols. And EDNO and our members are a strong support of an open internet. And we reject any uh, attempt to fragment the internet using top-down protocols. This is bad for democracy, it's bad for investment, and it's also bad for achieving universal connectivity. Thank you. Thank you. Let me just use this one. Um, thanks very much, Madam Moderator. Africa is a uh, youngest internet region and has known challenges in several areas uh, from stable connectivity, lack of devices, capacity, content application, uh, education, and new entrants, and quite often insufficient multi stakeholder community engagement. And uh, if you think these are many, just imagine what they were roughly 30 years ago when our internet was arriving. As there are no uh, you know, technologies for addressing some of these challenges, I would rather focus on a new issue, and um, which is uh, technology security as in similar to food security. As internet penetration crosses 50%, Instead of internet shutdowns, we should be seeking continuous internet. Referring to the second specific objective of the EU Digital Transformation Strategy for Africa, which aspires that by 2030, all access devices are manufactured in Africa and 30% of information resources and services are developed and hosted in Africa. With that in mind, we must begin to address the risks associated with the dependence on digital technologies and prepare how to maintain continuity. Now, a good amount of technical handicaps in Africa's internet operations are undertaken in projects with global partners. While we understand agency to complete a checklist, be aware that to acquire capacity to control networks is to do more of the technical networks ourselves. In the 90s, the majority of connectivity providers on the continent were indigenous ISPs, but that is no more. What policy lessons have we learned? Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, all. In two minutes, certainly the cost of infrastructure deployment is a factor that uh, affects affordability. The cost of regulating that uh, infrastructure and those markets, especially if there's poor regulation, drives up the cost. The cost for certainly for small island developing states, um, isolated in some cases, the cost of subsea fiber connectivity, the cost of capital to fund this infrastructure is important. And we have to talk about partnerships with international financial institutions like the World Bank, uh, Inter-American Development Bank, and others that can provide cheaper capital to invest. Um, there's also issues with well, the regulation, the cost of infrastructure, and also the deployment, the technology behind it. And we're seeing uh, new advances in things like open media access networks that allows for the sharing of infrastructure that drives down the cost as well to consumers. So the ability to use new technologies, to use the new technologies that are coming on board, like neo satellites and 5G in a properly regulated environment and where we can cooperate across regions 
to on things like harmonization of regulations and policy and spectrum allocation that will help to drive down the cost. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Good morning. I hope that, uh, that you can hear me. So the challenges are complex and they're also, let's say, multi-layered. We use a model that we call our digital transformation wheel. Uh, and we tackle those challenges through three specific areas, access, adoption, and value creation. Of course, on the access side, the challenge, the biggest challenge is getting the infrastructure in place. Um, there's a cost, as Rodney has, has just mentioned, which is why we need to develop new business models. When infrastructure for connectivity is in place, of course, affordability is also a big barrier, the cost of services, and of course, the cost of devices. And I think this takes us back to the first question on the importance of partnerships and multi-stakeholder collaboration. The second pillar is adoption, and Minister Paula has referred, uh, referred to this as well. The need for digital skills and literacy is absolutely critical. And of course, we need local content and local languages. That's absolutely fundamental. And then, of course, the third pillar is that value creation. That's where the life-changing impact comes into play. Uh, so being able to access a huge range of social, government, educational, and financial services. And that's where the internet can really bring uh, key value to, to people's lives. I would say also added to that is the need to empower people to become creators and to be able to innovate new services and resources that bring value to others. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Ms. Bowman. I can see you have gone into overtime as well. So I'm going to ask you to please stay with us for another couple of minutes.
Good morning. My name is Onika Makwakwa. I'm the head of Africa at the recently launched Global Digital Inclusion uh, Partnership. Our team developed a rural broadband uh, policy framework, and the motivation for this was precisely because policy and regulation are seldom uh, focused on the realities of rural and remote areas. This framework uh, is a policy guide that uh, is a guide that um, provides uh, guidance for actions that will support affordable and meaningful connectivity in these specific areas. Actions um, that are recommended need to include, for example, clear and time-bound targets to affordable and meaningful connectivity with minimum data, a, a speed, appropriate uh, device, and frequency of access uh, for users, specifically for the rural area. Uh, and here it becomes even more important to also include gender targets, because if we don't have these targets, we will not close this gap uh, on its own. It's, it will not happen naturally. So it's important to have time-bound targets for how we are addressing the digital gender gap that we heard about uh, at the opening of this session. We have examples of this uh, type of framework already in place uh, in countries such as Benin, as well as the Dominican Republic. It is also uh, recommended within this uh, framework that we look at unlicensed and low-cost spectrum for community-based connectivity solutions to thrive, accompanied with open access solutions to infrastructure networks. There is a lot of examples and a lot of sessions, I believe, happening also within this IGF that will look at how rural areas uh, through community networks and other uh, technologies are actually taking advantage of uh, looking at different technology models as well as different financial models to close these gaps and make sure that people in the rural areas also have affordable and meaningful connectivity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, firstly, before I make a few remarks, uh, I'd like to acknowledge the host country of your Ethiopia, uh, of course, the minister, uh, Mr. His Honorable Benete Mola Jefahun, who is uh, present with us here, and of course, the state minister, Ria Alim Bui. Thank you very much for the kind welcome and hospitality so far. Uh, this is our first time to travel to Addis Ababa. We are a country that is very far from here. It's about seven hours time difference. And it's exciting for us to come and uh, be part of this very important uh, occasion. And of course, we are in a very uh, knowledgeable people in this, in this sector. Um, just as a way of uh, saying a few things about what we are addressing in Papua New Guinea, I want to thank the IGF for facilitating a platform for all regions and citizens to have access to internet, ensure, ensuring that no one is left behind. Uh, in a short space of time, my country, Papua New Guinea, has gained much needed traction in its digital transformation journey. And we acknowledge that internet remains a crucial and a critical enabler for digital transformation. And, and so um, we are happy to be here for this uh, very important uh, uh, meeting. Uh, this year, we have shifted uh, our focus back to our broader infrastructure planning to address the broader goals of accessibility, affordability, and uh, reliability. Realigning our national broadband plan and universal access policy, and consequently, we'll be making amendment to our National ICT Act of 2009 in our effort to bring internet connectivity to all, set all, uh, all the citizens of our country. Uh, in early September, I had the opportunity to attend the regional IGF meeting in Singapore, and uh, I met a uh, lot of uh, very interesting people. And of course, uh, Reverend, if you can just give me a little bit of uh, time. I'm from a very far country, so <laughs> why not? <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. So uh, last week, my ministry with our Department of ICT uh, and regulator finalized our national broadband plan. Um, at a stakeholder workshop, and this is uh, basically, um, internet is new to my country. 
and of course to uh, to our region. And what we are doing right now is trying to uh, involve our stakeholders and our people to migrate into that uh, area in technology so that uh, we can catch up on uh, what, is, what the world is doing right now. So it's very interesting that uh, maybe I can have some more time later. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here on your 15th panel. So I work for ICANN, and um, just to explain what we do, every time you go online, you hit about something that actually originates from us. And us. I haven't had breakfast, so that will work. Thank you. Is it better now? Anyway, every time you go online, you hit about something that originates from ICANN and our technical partners. Together, we provide the three building blocks of the internet. The IP addresses, the DNS, and the IP protocols. Today we have more than 5 billion users using those three building blocks, which is a fantastic number, which we never had estimated. That is what actually creates, technically, the interoperable, the open internet, that everybody uses the same system. But internet is not done. It's fair to say that when it was invented and started, it was done from a Latin script and English language. One of the big challenges we have right now is to make sure that anyone who goes online, the next billion users, can use their own language, their own script. They don't have to read from left to right. They don't know how to know what a dot is. And this is one of the important things for us from the technical community to work with, for instance, with governments to make sure that when in procurement, you put in demands of what we call universal acceptance, which is basically to promote your own language. But another thing we are doing right now, which is important to us, is that everybody in this panel agrees that, especially for Africa, we have to think differently. We have to do it in a different way. The ordinary business models, the ordinary way of doing things will not work. So on Thursday, ICANN is launching something we call the Coalition for Digital Africa, whereas we invite other partners to work with us from a technical community and really be a building block to rethink how we do things together. ICANN as a pledge for that, we already made our first investment here in Africa to do that, which we did when we launched in Kenya two weeks ago, where we built the first called cluster, root server cluster in Kenya. That has the effect that we saw immediately that before that, about 40% of all queries, all internet traffic actually went to Europe. Now it's less than 10%. We saw an immediate effect on that investment. That means that people in Africa who access the internet now has a faster internet and more secure internet. And talking about investment plans, we charge nothing to do that. So going forward, I think that we have to come back to the important thing of rethinking things. Another example of that is that ICANN, for the first time, made a pledge to the I2D to work together with partners to promote something we think is very important, local country code. Thank you. Great. Uh, this is where peer, gender specific and geographical uh, specific targets and programs uh, come in. The Universal Service and Access Funds and other private, uh, public and private uh, initiatives uh, come in uh, to play a critical role here in helping us close uh, these di divides and making sure that those who are historically disadvantaged are not once again left behind on these uh, digital developments. USFs should be used uh, to their fullest extent. And in the case of gender, 50% of the resources should indeed be used to ensure women and girls' participation uh, and that they actually are not just participating, but they are meaningfully uh, connected uh, to digital opportunities. Our team did a study of the, uh, with the U UN Women uh, of the Universal Service and Access Funds and we found that, for the most part, uh, these funds uh, were existing, but were largely not used for what they were meant for. We cannot accept that, and these are important mechanisms. Uh,
market to make sure that we are more efficient and we set the targets to close the di digital uh, divides that exist at the moment. Thank you. Yes, thank you, thank you so much. Um, so let me take the second part of your question first. I think it's about um, to be as inclusive as possible, we need that multi-stakeholder approach. And I do think we have to put partnership at the center of our efforts. Um, no one can solve the challenge alone. Um, we need to work together to ensure that the needs of vulnerable groups are of course addressed and of course, we have to involve uh, the vulnerable groups in our work to hear from them on their own connectivity needs and also to co-develop solutions that actually respond to those needs. Uh, we, are, we have a number of flagship initiatives. I think Goran was about to give a shout out uh, to the pledge that he made to our partner to connect digital coalition, uh, first ever UN pledging platform dedicated to connectivity. Uh, we have uh, more than 500 pledges that have been made, amounting to some 29 billion. Um, we're looking forward to growing that. Uh, another example is in the space of school connectivity, and Minister Paula is one of our giga countries, our giga effort with UNICEF to connect every school in the world to, uh, to the internet and every young person to information opportunity and choice. Uh, and of course, other efforts specific to, to women and girls are linked to our, our coding work. And perhaps I'll, I'll come back to that later uh, and, and share a little bit more about our African Girls Can Code and our America's Girls Can Code. Thank you. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, I actually I had jumped in thinking you had called me before. So let me just uh, highlight um, the, the programs and, and initiatives that we're advancing. Um, of course, to be as inclusive as possible, I think it's vital that we take multi, a multi-stakeholder approach and we put partnerships at the center of our efforts because no one's gonna solve this, this challenge on their own. Uh, we have to work together across sectors and across silos to ensure that the needs of vulnerable groups are addressed. Uh, and of course, we need to directly involve these groups in our work to hear from them on their needs and to co-develop solutions that respond to those needs. Um, an example, uh, and I think that, that Goran was, was about to, to, to note this specifically, uh, is the pledge that he has made to our partner to connect Digital Coalition, a first ever UN pledging platform. Uh, we unveiled those pledges a couple of months ago in Kigali. We have more than 500 pledges that have been made amounting to some 29 billion uh, in investments and we're excited to, to grow that. We also have our GIGA uh, school connectivity work. Um, Rwanda is one of our flagship countries. We work with UNICEF as our key partner, uh, aiming to connect every school in the world to the internet and every young person to information, opportunity, and choice. Um, of course, our overarching goal is to promote sustainable models in the space of schools, but also in other, in other areas. Sustainability has got to be key. And of course, that, pub, that public-private partnership uh, is absolutely fundamental. Thank you. Can you hear me now? 
so we are struggling to hear. So I wasn't sure you had asked, you had called on me. So I, I will also pick off from where uh, the previous speakers uh, left off. I think uh, as a starting point, as we think about the shift from uh, basic to meaningful and affordable connectivity, um, it takes us back to the you know the second question that you asked a different group of panelists, which is really around what are the challenges um, for for you know for our people, for our citizens to be able to access uh, meaningful and affordable connectivity. And I think at the heart of all of, of this question is um, one word, which is really affordability, and and really looking at how do we put in place uh, new business models where, for example, we can provide subsidized packages or discounts on broadband service, and we've seen other some countries that are doing it, including the affordable connectivity program, where different households are identified and provided with discounts to this uh, uh, broadband service. Now, I know both Doreen and, and some of the previous speakers also spoke about the Universal uh, Access and Service Fund. Um, I think in many ways for most countries, this fund is not enough. Um, but what is key is how is it deployed and what is it addressing? Is it, is it only addressing uh, connectivity gaps, but how, how, what portion of it can also be put towards uh, these discounts and subsidized packages that can allow uh, for meaningful connectivity to be accessed by, by the different citizens? Then the second bit in terms of programs that are being put uh, to shift from both from basic to meaningful connectivity is the innovative models. Doreen Bogdan did mention uh, GIGA. And one of the things that we did when we were deploying school connectivity models here as a pilot was being able to experiment with a shift from a CAPEX model to an OPEX model as a way to, to, to figure out how we can use the little resources we have uh, to deploy uh, school connectivity programs in, in as many schools as possible. And this has proven uh, very successful. And the last part of your question, which I want to briefly touch on is how do we then make sure that you know those that continue to be excluded are included uh, in terms of how they can access this meaningful activity. The first thing is that we have to be very intentional about it as we design our programs, uh, thinking about uh, these marginalized groups. For Rwanda, whether it's women uh, led households, whether it's people with disabilities, these are some of the things that we continue uh, to put at the forefront of those people that we um, emphasize being able to connect so that the inclusion agenda can be put forward. The thing is, if you can't count these people, then you're prob probably not including them. And so our starting point has been even identifying these different categories and then intentionally building them into the programs uh, that we put in place to uh, push for last mile connectivity. Thank you. Thank you. I think many of the questions were brought up by, by one thing I always think about when these questions comes up, and I think that, again, coming back to what the, the, if we talk about Africa as a continent and all the countries in Africa, I think it's important to realize that from coming from organizations like mine, we're here to help, we're here to serve, we're not here to define the problems or come up with the solutions to the problems. Because the, the in this specific continent, like anywhere else, there's sort of a reinventing of how things are done. To, to bring out an equal and interoperable internet in the rest of the world was much easier than to do it here. And that's why we try to work with our partners here to really understand the problem, but the solutions has to come from this region. It has to be, internet for Africa has to come from Africans rather than from other organizations as well. When it comes to the uh, equality and get people online, I think in a way the internet is itself is one of the both built equalizers. I often speak about when I was in Latin America many years ago, when I asked the questions of why is it important to get people online, and I was expecting the answer that is so important for people for unemployment and stuff. But they said something is that if you peep, get people online, you take away one of the biggest disadvantages that exist for poor people, access to information. Access to information has always been a rich man's right. If you get people online, if you get people online so they can go to a diverse internet, you will actually help them a lot by making sure that they have access to the same information. So internet itself, I think, is an equalizer. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to build on the previous comments about the importance of building uh, local content and solutions. We are particularly proud of our program, Connected African Girls Initiative. These are coding camps that uh, we're bringing young girls and women uh, to uh, learn 
uh, all sorts of skills from uh, machine learning to artificial intelligence. So far, we've trained about 25,000 uh, young girls and women across, across Africa and uh, uh, growing. So this, again, is very important. In addition to that, uh, we've openly, uh, opened recently an African Regional uh, Center of Excellence for Artificial Intelligence uh, in Congo, Brazzaville, again, enabling uh, young girls and women and, and boys uh, to have access to uh, this, this uh, um, opportunity. Um, so again, building infrastructure to support uh, increased uh, in, uh, internet penetration on the continent. We're very proud of our uh, African Regional Center for Cybersecurity that's going to be established in Togo. Um, again, with the same principle, making this uh, uh, an, an, an opportunity for everyone, uh, 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 elucidating what are the, the opportunities. So uh, earlier I, I was talking about the infrastructure. So as you know, the African Union has the uh, digital uh, strategy, uh, tra digital transformation strategy for Africa. So we are supporting at the country level to formulate national uh, digital transformation strategy. This is very important so that we can identify what are the key issues and problems at the country level so that uh, the national solutions and uh, specific solutions that were Paul made reference to earlier can, can become a, a reality. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam uh, Moderator. Um, to improve basic connectivity um, uh, to the level of uh, affordable um, and uh, um, uh, meaningful uh, connectivity, um, uh, in my opinion, you know, policymakers um, uh, and the regulators uh, and other stakeholders um, can intervene using tools or uh, levers um, that can. Um, uh, uh, encourage uh, the investment uh, policy uh, and uh, regulatory uh, programs, um, one of which is uh, introducing a competition. When we introduce a competition, um, uh, we can achieve uh, the quality of service, uh, we can achieve uh, the affordability uh, as well as uh, the uh, accessibility and availability of uh, the um, infrastructure. Uh, uh, and also it is uh, good you know, to introduce um, uh, programs uh, like uh, public-private uh, partnership uh, and private sector involvement and increase uh, the coverage of uh, uh, the network. Uh, the other program which can be um, uh, implemented is um, reduce uh, taxes on uh, devices, especially on uh, smartphones, um, and also introduce mechanisms like uh, device subsidies, especially uh, for uh, uh, rural areas um, uh, and for uh, 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 not hubs. Uh, and also uh, the implementation of universal service um, uh, and the uh, uh, universal service fund is uh, uh, one of uh, the mechanisms that can be uh, implemented. Uh, and the other is uh, to put in place alternative uh, energy source uh, mechanisms. Because in rural areas, we know that, you know, um, the energy availability uh, hampers really uh, the connectivity, especially uh, when we consider it as a meaningful uh, connectivity. Um, uh, so uh, all these um, the mechanisms, especially in policy area, uh, we can uh, make it uh, inclusive, uh, like to entertain the gender uh, uh, gap addressing, uh, as, as well as uh, also the uh, uh, the uh, f f accessibility, f yeah, accessibility for people with uh, disabilities. Thank you.
Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I'm, sli I'm slightly biased because I, I have, I'm going to admit my bias. I, I think the, the youth and the generation coming are arguably, arguably, not arguably for me, but are going to be the most intelligent, most productive generation there is. And I think that will happen um, whether we train them or not, if they have devices. I think access is the most important thing. Having said that, if we want to accelerate that conclusion that I assert, I think we do need to provide uh, training in all these areas. And as Meta, and I'll quickly, because I know two minutes goes quickly, I'll try and speak to some of the training that we've provided uh, across this continent, but also further afield. So first and foremost, Digify Pro, I think we've trained now 200,000 people face-to-face -face with instructors. We've reached 4.7 million people through Facebook and Instagram. Trained, it gives people skills to use ICTs, but also trains them in, in a way to use ICTs safely, respectfully, um, and to drive equity in many, many ways. I think we can speak to our boost with business. And I see so many government stakeholders in the, in the um, uh, 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 auditorium who have benefited and their people have benefited from boost with business. So we've trained 300,000 people face-to-face -face with boost with business and probably reached about 3.8 million people using those sorts of programs. It's essential that companies like Meta do this sort of training. But I think what's more important is that we give young people, again, who will be the most productive, most intelligent generation that we have, the, the, the devices and the access to, to, to forge their own path as well and to undertake that training. That's two minutes and one second, Madam Chair. Do I get, a, do I get an applause this time? Yes. yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Well, we all agree, I believe, that digital skill is uh, a component of meaningful connectivity. And it's not only skills on how to use and, and benefit from the internet, but also sk skills about how to code, create, design the internet, because this is our society of tomorrow. Well, in, in Europe, uh, 2023 is the European Year of Skills, and in 2021, the European Commission set digital decade targets. And why is this important? Because we think this can help driving skills too. And uh, part of the digital decade targets is skill. So by 2030, the commission aims to have 20 million ICT specialists in Europe, which is, uh, and a much higher proportion of women than today. And we need to have 80% of the population to have ba uh, basic digital skills. So I think targets can help us uh, upskilling and skilling people. And uh, what we see is uh, we can have a teaching of skills in academic institutions that can be supported by public and private funding. But another very important point that we see from the industry is upskilling. We need skilled labor. So we work together with the unions in upskilling people for the future. So one way uh, where a population can have access to skills, upskilling or reskilling is through multi-stakeholder partnerships, which we see around the world. And this includes the industry that I represent working together with governments and civil societies. So uh, one final reminder from my side the climate must be right, not only on the investment, but we need an open global uh, internet based on international standards and governed in the bottom-up way. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now Uh, 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 
Okay, thank you very much. And we had a slight technical challenge there, so we've swapped out the mic. I'm going to ask Mr. Nee Quinar to answer the question. Thanks, Madam Moderator. Well, as a teacher, I say to the youth, go to school, get skills, be entrepreneurial, and live on the internet. In the technical space, the African Internet Technical Institutions, AFSTAR, will be there to help you keep up with the skills. Seems widely accepted that quality broadband connectivity contributes to GDP. Thus, what the broadband is used for will contribute differently to GDP. Hence, what skills, what importantly, education may be a major factor a meaningful connectivity. We should develop technical skills and partners should urge we do the technical work to acquire the skills to prevent inadvertently outsourcing technical capacities, especially around the name services, CCTLDs and DNSSEC. By taking the ready way, we fail to develop our technical capacity we should be cautious because there are some operational decisions which are difficult to reverse. There's a long cycle of science and technology research preceding commercial products of the internet. We need to ensure our educational and research institutions are abreast and plugged into the global research activities and are resourced to contribute. As we accomplish our goals on access, the differentiation among economies will be the quality of the education and research in the disciplines leading to the technologies. This will require we upgrade academic curriculums and labs to be more internet or network friendly and pursue science and technology geared towards local problems. 
we promote the national research and education networks as a means of providing connectivity to education and research institutions, including schools. Keep it together and share. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Quinar. I now ask Mr. Rodney Taylor to respond to the question. Thank you very much, Joel. I'll just, since examples have been, well, the answer question has been answered, so I'll just give an example from the Caribbean, where I'm from, in particular Barbados, a project I was involved in called Digital Ambassadors. And what it was, was that uh, education is free at the point of delivery up to tertiary education, but those students in particular who are doing computer studies are required to give back some time to the communities, in particular when governments uh, when the government launches a digital service, a new digital service, they are part of the uh, development cycle, they're part of the user acceptance testing, and they receive training first. And they are then deployed in community centers and schools and bring the, uh, the older generation on board. They focus on persons with disabilities and marginalized groups. So I think that's an excellent initiative to mainstream young people as part of the whole digital transformation initiative then they have the capacity and the natural affinity to go and train uh, the wider community and raise the level of digital skills across the board in society. Of course, there are other initi initiatives. ITU has excellent uh, online courses through the ITU Academy. Um, we have Girls in ICT as well, a good initiative to ensure that women are included. Um, Cisco has Girls Power Tech, which we've used in the Caribbean. There's Caribbean Girls Hack as well. And these initiatives that help to mainstream women and young people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Excellency Mesu. Uh, thank you. Thank you again, uh, uh, Madam Moderator. The uh, question on um, digital skills is extremely important and one uh, we in my country are grappling with ourselves. We're working hard to improve digital skills for our students, government workers, and our small and uh, medium ed enterprises also. We are working with our national education department and our universities to upgrade the curriculum in schools and embed digital ICT literacy in the curriculums. Our plan is to work closely with the youth, primary and secondary students and conduct training for them. And the students will then educate their parents on digital and ICT literacy, because it's a new wave of technology for us in the country. And uh, we are trying our very best not to leave any, any person behind. We will encourage the industry and our partners to support digital literacy for our farmers and SMEs as well. So um, um, we are working to build ICT labs in many of our schools and community centers. Just recently, I opened two uh, ICT labs in a, in, a, in a secondary school and in a community. And that includes um, uh, youths, girls, persons with disabilities and others who can experiment with uh, this new technology. So we also having several uh, awareness activities all through our country to educate people on digital skills. Like when the internet came, uh, arrived in our country not so long ago, it's, it's taken the country by storm and many of our people do not know how to use and they are illiterate in the usage of um, literacy in, in many of the parts of the country and and, and thus making them uh, misuse uh, internets and, and and of course the uh, social media and all that uh, on, on, on the um, on the net so um, we are working very closely with those in the industry to help create some training programs in the past month, we have signed an MOU with one of our national universities to host a program. And we are also working with the PNG Computer Society and the PNG Digital uh, ICT clusters on other digital literacy projects. So um, I'm happy also that we have signed an MOU with EPINIC. And I'm also happy that Cisco is, has been, is, we, we have an, an agreement with Cisco. And okay, I can, thank you, Excellency. I'm going to have thank to wrap you up there. Thank you very much. And I come now to Doreen Bogdan Martin and for her response to the question. Thank you. Um, let me perhaps jump back to something that Gorin had mentioned that the internet is the greatest equalizer, but for that to happen, that digital skills piece is absolutely essential. 
Uh, our research shows that lack of digital skills is actually one of the biggest barriers to uptake and to digital transformation. So we need more digital skills education, and I would say we need it as early as possible. Um, digital skills and awareness should be taught in schools as young as, well, at the primary level, we would say, and that's something that we're, we're advancing through our GIGA school connectivity effort. Uh, core skills that all people, including young people, need to have today also include media and information literacy, as well as online safety skills. That lifelong learning is also becoming increasingly important. And of course, ITU uh, is doing our part, advancing different programs in digital skills training. Rodney has just referred to the ITU Academy. We also have our digital transformation centers. We have seven of them in Africa, focusing on basic digital literacy, on the intermediate piece, on training the trainer, and also the training for SMEs in digital technologies, innovation, also entrepreneurship. We work closely with the ILO and the African Union on boosting decent jobs and digital skills for youth in Africa. We have our coding workshops, our African Girls Can Code, our America's Girls Can Code, the Caribbean Girls Can Code, our Equals Global Partnership, which is very focused on women and girls, digital skills, digital entrepreneurship, and of course, our Generation Connect effort focused on young people. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now move on to the next question. Looking forward to the future of a post-COVID world, what lessons can we retain from the pandemic about digital infrastructures that are meaningful to human development? And just giving you a little bit of the situation that Barbados found itself in, where we have almost 80% penetration but yet when the pandemic hit and we went on lockdown and you found you had online school, we found that we may have had the access, but not the device by which to access. So you may have a situation where you have a home that has three children, two parents, the three kids are different ages in different levels of school. The parents, maybe one is working from home, but there's one laptop or one phone. So while I'm liking this, the way that we're framing the conversation is one of the digital in infrastructures access to affordable devices. And I'm gonna start with you, Mr. Pedro. Thank, thank you very much. So um, COVID-19 is, is, was of course challenging for everyone, including in Africa. It accentuated the digital divide, uh, which you referred to earlier, uh, not only uh, between the north and south, but within countries themselves, in the urban rural divide. But it equally provided, um, it demonstrated the value proposition of, of digital transformation in the sense that uh, we've, uh, uh, we were capable of, of uh, uh, informal or, or bringing innovative solutions to some of our problems from e-procurement uh, that facilitated, for example, uh, access to uh, goods and services to Africa. I mean, for example, if through the platforms that we created uh, from ATEX to AVAT and so on, that we enable Africa to have access, for example, to vaccines, to goods and services. So moving forward, and that's, that's where, I mean, uh, here, uh, moderator, I would uh, please plead for you to give me a little bit of more time, where well, my reference to uh, the uh, African Union Summit of Heads of State and Government is important uh, because it's, it's about moving forward. And the summit has recognized, as I started with, that digital is, uh, transformation is key uh, to achieving those, those goals. So, uh, and we need to be able to demonstrate that value proposition across several jurisdictions. For example, um, with the studies and evidence that shows that investments in digital transformation will contribute significantly to GDP and so on and so forth. There you have the attention of the ministers of finance who can then deploy uh, resources for us to be able to, to invest in, in, in improving infrastructure, broadband access and so on and so forth. The countries that we're celebrating today from Rwanda to many others on the continent have recognized that importance early 
uh, in, the, in the development of the digital uh, infrastructure and ecosystems. And they put money there. So we need to invest more in, in, the, in, that, that, in that process. For example, in Central Africa, uh, they, I mean, the cost of access to internet is, is prohibitive. And one of our efforts was to really to try and demonstrate by comparing what Central Africa was not doing and what East Africa was doing when they established in one network area. And what the, the, the advantage it creates in terms of facilitating business processes and, and uh, inter access to common citizens and so on and so forth. And it was with those numbers that we convinced policymakers in Central Africa to move with the agenda to create a one network in Central Africa. Okay, so this, both, both of these you you up there. Thank you. Better wrap you up there. Thank you very much. And now I go to Ms. Paula Inabir. Thank you very much, uh, moderator. And I think you touched on it when you shared uh, Barbados's example. Um, and, and I think what, uh, you know, the COVID uh, experience has all taught us is that uh, one necessity breeds invention. So what we saw was an accelerated, um, you know, a digital transformation where massive investments were made, um, you know, across different countries to ensure that there's access. But then quickly we realized that, yes, access is one thing. And that's why you see many countries will rank very high when it comes to coverage statistics, but then very low when it comes to usage. And the things that you rightly mentioned, moderator, which is really devices, skills, and everything are really what it will take to ensure that the number of people that are able to access or the number of people that are living within uh, areas that are covered can also in many ways be able to meaningfully access and benefit from the infrastructure that has been deployed. Now, I think what we've also learned is that the prepared were able to weather the storm better. And, and I guess even going forward, uh, our effort is to say, anytime we could have any kind of crisis that is happening, how better prepared are we when it comes to broadband infrastructure, when it comes to making sure that people are meaningfully connected and that they'll be able to weather whatever storm that we find. And I don't think we're going to return to normal because today when you see how every workplace is really changing uh, to ensure that a hybrid mode of working is, is really acceptable, uh, schools are shifting to a hybrid way of learning and teaching. And so it's really just making sure that we have these accelerated investments, but it must be a multi-pronged effort. It's not just the infrastructure, it's all these other things that we've discussed over the last one hour or so, which is ensuring that we have affordable devices, we have the right content in the right in, in, in the local languages that is accessible to everyone. Uh, we're able to gamify this content, we're able to deliver it in an interesting manner. But at the same time, we're also able to make sure that affordability remains uh, uh, possible by bundling all the services. So that's what the COVID experience has taught us uh, to really figure out a multi-pronged approach to delivering meaningful connectivity. Thank you very much, Ms. Enaber. And I now call on Ms. Onika Makwaka for your comments. Thank you, uh, Margarita, for sharing that uh, experience. It actually helps to uh, demonstrate the inequalities that were um, highlighted by our COVID-19 experience. First, um, I think one of the things is that uh, we are at a point post-COVID where digital policies uh, have a much greater understanding and that understanding needs to permeate through across uh, other sectors as well. So it is really important that we collaborate even ever more uh, so now to make sure that uh, we are actually meeting people's needs uh, by making sure that digital policies actually can be worked across all sectors, health, education, uh, et cetera, that uh, can help uh, improve people's lives. Secondly, I think uh, through this discussion, it's quite clear that there is a resource need in order for us to address uh, these uh, inequalities and reach universal access. Uh, a recent uh, documentation by ITU, I believe, pegs it at about $428 billion needed uh, to connect everyone uh, universally. Even if private sector could contribute half of that, we still need governments to come and make commitments as well as uh, development aid and other sectors to contribute uh, towards closing that gap. And lastly, I would be remiss if I did not mention that COVID-19 also 
So as uh, we also saw a rise in online gender-based violence that is counterproductive towards our digital inclusion efforts. So it is important that we begin to look at policies to ensure that we minimize, uh, or actually not minimize, we eliminate uh, violence online against women because it is one of the factors that contributes towards the digital gender gap. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Lee, you wanted to say a few words? Thank you, um, Madam Moderator. I'm sorry to ask the floor again. That I just want to share the two more pieces of the information for the, all participants with regard to go beyond um, uh, after all the pandemic. Um, after our IGF next um, September, United Nations is going to host our uh, SDG summit. I guess um, uh, we will go together um, uh, for the mm review -hmm. for SDG implementation. So it would be a good occasion for us, for all stakeholders to, to take into account what we need to achieve uh, by <clears throat> the SDG. And second, uh, the Secretary General also proposed uh, to launch the global digital compact to be adopted by, uh, uh, to be adopted in 2024 when the UN is going to host the summit of the future. Actually, we have invited the all contributions from the all stakeholders. We hope that we uh, would collect the all contributions from you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I am now going to go to Mr. Quenar, chairman of Ghana.com. Thank you very much, Madam Moderator. Um, the internet grows at the edge where we develop benefits from applications that solve our problems. The cracks showed up when during COVID pandemic, we were challenged to use the internet uh, during the lockdowns and the local services were not there, were not available. We all saw at that time the potential of the domestic internet. The internet had been positioned as though to provide access to international services, to services overseas. Operators took users to international content providers. The internet had not permeated nor been assimilated sufficiently into the domestic economy and the social fabric. The exchange points have worked well for us, but unfortunately content was not following the exchange points and in-country links need to become more affordable. The infrastructure and arrangements were not prepared for such stress tests. We could not easily take people from homes to offices, nor from homes to schools. We could not acquire the local services we needed online. We need to have a plan for such situations. Online was not yet part of the culture, but is fast becoming so since, post, since COVID and we shall embrace the various emerging virtual working and meetings innovations in mass so that we can expand our reach. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And Mr. Paul Scully, your comment? Thank you very much. And uh, you, you're absolutely right to highlight the acceleration that has been caused through COVID, the, the digital infrastructures and the test of which I think actually the multi-stakeholder framework has um, come out really positively for because you saw so many bodies rising to the challenges of the pandemic, whether it was uh, public authorities providing healthcare advice and obviously private and public authorities providing education for so many uh, children businesses and retailers providing services online and collaboration between scientists, which uh, resulted in really successful vaccination program in so many parts of the world. Um, but we've got to make sure that we embed the learning of that and shape the change that is coming. We talked, I heard about hybrid working. We've got to make sure that we all work together to, um, to capture that change. And ICANN uh, underpins so much of that with their work uh, fishing out the bad actors who were um, looking at, you know, phishing and scams and those kind of things by suspending domain names and, and deleting domain names, which um, perpetuated such abuse. But I should just finally say, conclude by welcoming 
the UNIGF in this regard because the crucial role that it facilitated discussions um, was, was very positive. Not being a decision-making body allows stakeholders to the freedom to try out, to explore, to debate and discuss um, new policy ideas without being restricted by a binding vote at the end of the annual meeting. But it's important that we work on the technologies as well for young people to be able to access these, as, as you as you rightly said at the beginning. But that will be discussed through um, public government and the private sector and new technologies helping younger people access the digital infrastructure across the world. Thank you very much. And our final question before we wrap up. What measures are currently in place to ensure more affordable, meaningful, and inclusive connectivity in Africa and beyond? And what kind of international framework do we need to complement these and achieve Agenda 2030? I'm going to start with you, Mr. Taylor. Thank you very much. Uh, I can speak to examples in the Caribbean. A Carib IX is one initiative that um, seeks to deploy internet exchange points, which is a part of the infrastructure as well, to drive more efficient routing of network traffic and reduce the costs. Uh, because uh, local content in particular doesn't need to be transited internationally, and there's a cost to that. Of course, there is a whole ecosystem around IXP, such as caching and so on, that will help to improve uh, internet access uh, and make it more meaningful, especially if there is local content uh, to, be, to be accessed. In addition, I think that the issue of universal service funds, we've spoken about this before, uh, need to be deployed more effectively. Uh, there's no point having hundreds of millions of dollars sitting on a bank account uh, when it cannot be used to, to pay for devices and to train and to provide access at community centers and so on. And I think lastly, that if we see the issue of uh, connectivity as a universal right, then we ought to approach it as a universal right and seek to have a global digital compact. And I know this is an initiative of the United Nations, a global digital compact that um, provides all the necessary resources in particular to developing countries to drive down the cost of uh, connectivity and make it more meaningful with all of the other considerations that we've spoken up today uh, with respect to meaningful and affordable connectivity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Taylor. Excellency Mesu. Uh, thank, thank you again. again. Uh, the, the government of Papua New Guinea, through my ministry, and, and of course the Department of ICT and our regulator, NICTA, uh, we worked uh, working very closely to, to uh, close the digital gap and make universal access a reality. We are working to ensure that no one is left behind. And, and, and that is why we have added special emphasis and efforts um, geared to ensuring that women, girls, Persons with disabilities, indigenous persons are not uh, left out. So um, in, in progressing this last week, we have a stakeholder workshop on our new universal access service policy, where we laid out our goals and objectives on connectivity. As we stated at the ITU plenipotentiary and at our broadband plan and UAS stakeholder workshops, it is crucial that women and girls Persons with disabilities, indigenous groups, and others are included in this digital economy. It is why we are, uh, we are devoted to a separate focus area on, on, on this, this, this issue. Um, we, we have uh, uh, very important plans that uh, we want to roll out uh, as far as uh, connectivity and accessibility affordability is concerned. And uh, we don't want to leave our, our neighbors behind, like our Pacific uh, brothers and sisters. And, and so we are uh, offering help to our neighbors in the, in the Pacific region okay. as well. Thank Excellency, you. I'm going to have to wrap you up there. Thank you very much. Excellency Rebo. Thank you. I will try to address this um, connection to the scenario in our country. Um, the Ethiopian government has launched the homegrown economic uh, reform agenda, one of which is uh, to introduce a digital transformation. Accordingly, uh, 
Fiberization program to applications of the content as well as also support the digital skill and also to access it. I'm going to have to wrap you up. Thank you for the phone. Thank you. Um, to achieve 2030, the agenda, uh, I think it's an important starting point to bring the diverse elements together, meaning infrastructure, standards, governance, investment, innovation skills, to assure that IGF is fit for purpose going forward. And we heard, we're looking forward to the summit for future with the digital uh, global digital compact, and the new IGF leadership panel is one important part in this international framework. I think a strong uh, measure could be that we could actually set our own truly ambitious international agreed STGs for the internet in a multi-stakeholder way. We know that digital te technologies relate to many of the UN sustainable development goals. But we could use this momentum we have for the summit for the future and the compact to set a series of goals for how we want the internet and the digital economy to look in the next decade. Regions and countries are working on this too, such as EU digital uh, decade, setting objectives for connectivities and skills. And we see the work is going on in the US. And I wish, wish to say one final word on the importance of this process being inclusive. We will achieve meaningful and inclusive connectivity only if the governance framework is in fact inclusive. And this means that governance bodies need to look outside the immediate internet community to speak with and engage with those sectors who are building their business on the internet, like banking, like logistics, like healthcare. Okay, Mr. Martin, I'm going to have so, to wrap you up. Okay, here. sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Marby? Thank you. Thank you very much. It's always hard to be in the end of something because so many small things have been said. But I want to point out really to, to two things, and I want to do a little bit general comment. One of the amazing things when the COVID came around was that you never heard that the internet went down. Uh, we had the biggest internet day ever, uh, November, October, November 2020, with 8.4 billion requests into the system. Today, on an average, we have 8 trillion requests into the systems to provide you with internet. It never went down. You never hear it expressed on the internet for excellent down. And this is actually because it's a network of networks with many different players, all working according to standards and protocols. And we should not forget, so we can be able to maintain that, Every day, every conversation, there are discussions about doing this differently. And that can actually create a real fragmentation of the internet. The fragmentation of the internet means that you can't connect to the internet at all. You can't have a dual internet. It will always be one internet. And I'm happy to be part of providing that. But I think we shouldn't also forget that internet is local and global at the same time. Often when we talk about the big things everybody does, we talk it from a global scale. But it's very, very, very local. Most of the traffic actually goes between people, individuals in a country, in a region. And I think looking at Africa, it's so important to build the ecosystems in, that, in your own regions, your own countries, so the traffic, the business ideas, all of these actually stays within the country. 
And one of the interesting things of that is a project we're doing together under the pledge to the ITOD that we're trying to near uh, the capacity building and training country code operators. Why is that important? One of that I is to wrap to wrap you up the there, Mr. Marby. To we're heading to the finish line. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Mr. Boache, and we are even shorter. We're down to a minute and a half. Uh, a, a minute and a half isn't that much so <laughs> i will i will quickly say on um on this question of uh, miss madam chair can you take 10 seconds to remind me of the question <laughs> absolutely what measures are currently in place to ensure more affordable meaningful and inclusive connectivity in africa and beyond and what kind of international framework do we need to complement these and achieve agenda 2030 so great, so I can take 50 seconds, because I think most of those frameworks, as we said in the first question, are in place. I think the goals under the SDGs, I think the work of the ITU, I think the work of ICANN that we've heard my colleague on the left speak so eloquently about, give us enough multi-stakeholder frameworks to, uh, to move forward. Having said that, I do think there is need for reform in a, in a couple of areas. So um, one of the things that we are particularly focused on at Meta, and I know many others are, is spectrum reform. So use of unlicensed spectrum we know can be extremely beneficial, especially in the 51, uh, 57 to 71 gigahertz band. And we're seeing many parts of the world, not so much Africa, and I know many African, uh, under, the, under the auspices of the ITU, uh, many African regulators are thinking about it, but we certainly see that. And then the other big thing that we would like to see reform of, or the greater use of, is, is regulatory sandboxes. As a company that's focused on the next computing platform, the metaverse, rather than the internet, as well as the internet, we're starting to push innovation as hard as we can. And in some, in some countries, that innovation is being held back by the fact we don't have regulatory frameworks in place to support it. And we've seen the use of regulatory sandboxes uh, uh, um, bring great dividends in that area. So that's the reform. I hope that was 50 seconds or so. <laughs> and you got back your extra 10 seconds that I asked the question, so, so yes. <laughs> And Mr. Scully? Thank you very much. Yeah, it's it's not about legislation. It is about frameworks and partnerships, and they already exist, working well with the ICTs who know the importance that they have in helping deliver the SDGs. But we need to build on that framework to make sure that we can have the financial investments for private companies, the local expertise of civil society groups, all supporting digital access. And we're working to improve and expand internet connectivity and bridge the digital divide through those public par private partnerships. But we're also working on the last mile connectivity as well through um, uh, it, projects like the Kenya's national ICT plan that we're working with on TV white space um, and the national broadband plan and right away regulation in Nigeria. But then we go down to what we were talking about before about devices and it's really important that when I was in Kenya four years ago we were looking at bridge schools that were using tablets to deliver education there's a greater use of the acceleration of the internet when you're actually trying to tackle how to get girls who have to maybe walk 10k to their schools how you can de better deliver education all of that will work through frameworks organized by by the UK government by other governments but also organizations like IGF Thank you very much. And just before we wrap up, I am going to challenge all of you. Show me how good you are. Final comments, 30 seconds. I'm going to start with you, Excellency Masu. 30 seconds. Thank you very much. Uh, we want our people in our rural communities to have means of access uh, government goods and services through mo mobile phones uh, without the expense and wasted time of travel and queues, or have hospitals to be able to register births, uh, clinics and doctors to be able to register health visits or give a co convenient appointment time for children to receive their vaccines, for schools to make registrations, for students to, to be uh, easy and convenient at minimal or zero cost, and without walking for hours or standing Excellency, in long time winding queues. And that's what we want to do uh, in, in the space of internet. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Paula Ingeberg. I think uh, we've said it all uh, through the different interventions of the panelists. And what is key is that we build 
the right partnerships that are going to allow us to close on the gaps that we've highlighted, but also at the same time that will allow us to drive impact at scale. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Scully? Thank you. Just want to thank the IGF for bringing us all together for this um, a really important panel. The multi-stakeholder model is absolutely critical for bridging the digital divide. It's important that we all come together in partnership. And I know my colleagues there, I'm sorry, I can't be there, but my colleagues will be attending a number of the sessions uh, this week to explore ideas, how we can uh, achieve universal, affordable, and meaningful digital connectivity. So I wish you an excellent conference. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellency Reba. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, just I would like to say a few on uh, meaningful uh, connectivity. Uh, meaningful connectivity means it is a, uh, a people's experience. Uh, so it is an experience of unlocking the full power of internet access. Uh, for this to happen, we need uh, high-speed internet, uh, an appropriate device, unlimited broadband connection, uh, and unfragmented use. Thank you very much. Thank you. And you came in just under the radar. 30 seconds. Mr. Lee? Well, much has said that I just have the two sentences. Partnership among the all multi stakeholders for IGF. Second, action, action, action. Let's not hold back. Thank you very much. Mr. Pedro? Uh, the world of tomorrow is going to be much more complex that, than the world that we know today. So we need to invest in foresight capabilities, uh, all of those things. And the internet is at the center of it. So I'm very excited with uh, what is happening now. For example, there is this Zindi, which is a community of 50,000 da data scientists in Africa that are co-creating solutions. We need more of those moving forward because the solutions you really require is multi-sectoral analysis and so on and so forth. Thank you. Got to wrap you up there. And Ms. Bogdan Martin. Yes. Thank you. Um, so universal, affordable, meaningful, and I would add trusted connectivity is our goal. The ITU Plenty Pot declared that, as Minister Timothy noted, without it, without including the third of humanity that is digitally excluded, we won't achieve the SDGs. And to achieve that universal connectivity, we have to work together, all of us, focused on access, adoption, and value creation to unleash the transformative power of digital for all. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Taylor. Thank you very much, Joel. And 30 seconds is just enough for me to thank the IGF Secretary for uh, including us in the discussion and having a diverse panel from various regions. We represent small states in the Caribbean. And if we continue in this spirit of cooperation and inclusiveness, I think we have enough intellect and the, enough will to solve this problem of global meaningful connectivity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Quainar. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Well, Africa has come a long way uh, you know, in the past 30 years with internet. Uh, so before we go anywhere, we should look back a little and see what did we do right and what could we improve. Uh, but bear in mind that Africa is very diverse and very large. Uh, and you know, no one size fits all. It will require some patience, and some, you know, diligence, uh, maybe some interlocal uh, engagements, as well as interregional uh, solidarity. Okay, Mr. Quinn, I got to wrap you up there. Ms. Fur. Thank you. I'm extremely positive for the future. I think we have very interesting uh, work ahead of us. The multi-stakeholder model is essential for this. This panel showed us how many good things are going on out there, but I still believe we need some SDGs for the internet to make uh, the, the work count and have a, a good direction going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. In all development, it's important to realize where we come from. The, multi the technical organizations governed by multi stakeholder model is taking the system that was designed in the 60s to have more than 5 billion users. We've done that in a technical way. We don't interfere in politics. We don't take sides in discussions. It's important for us to be able to continue to do that work. 
so we can have one interconnected and open internet. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Mr. Boati? Yeah, fabulous to be in a room surrounded by people who are all very like-minded. I think we started by talking about the importance of multi-stakeholder partnerships, and I didn't see anybody shake their heads. It's also fabulous to be in a room where I can recognize my privilege, but also recognize the privilege of the whole audience in front of me, and to understand that we have two days, four days left to get together, speak about potential opportunities, as well as the challenges such as gender violence online and how to tackle them. And I hope that like me and my colleagues from Meta who are here, you will use your time uh, productively for the underprivileged. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Anika, you get the last word. Well, um, so gender exclusion is actually costing our countries a lot of money. In 2020, about a trillion dollars in GDP. So there is a co real cost to the exclusion. So I would urge us that despite the, apart from the fact that it is the right thing to do to make sure that we are mainstreaming gender in our ICT policies, it is also the cost efficient thing to do to make sure that we build an inclusive digital economy. Thank you. Thank you very much. And on that note, this is where we wrap up. We bring this session to a close. I want to thank everyone for attending. A really special thanks to my team. I mean, it was an amazing panel discussion, especially our persons who were online. Thank you so much. We look forward now to the report from the rapporteur coming out and seeing how we can move forward on these initiatives and collaborations. I'm going to ask you to give us a big round of applause for our, for our panelists and ask our panelists and our online guests not to move as we're gonna have our photo, photo op right here at the end. But thank you again, everyone. Thank you.